deal was that the colonists would pay a certain membership fee in, into the colony. And uh, for that membership fee, they would receive a five acre parcel of land, a house, and an orchard. And from that, that's where they were supposed to live for the rest of their lives and live off of this orchard. If you had paid your full membership into the colony, which for most people was about $600, you would receive your five acre parcel of land, uh, you would receive a full house, it had, it had quite a number of rooms in it, um, and your orchard and a well partially completed. Very few people were able to do that. They did not have $600. In fact, some of them only put in $200, $250 into their membership. And for those people, they received their still their five acres uh, block of land, but their house was reduced to a shanty, which was like maybe a 12 by 14 little building that they lived in. Our father was born in a shanty as there as we know, it was just like that one. It was sitting right down here in the creek, less than a half a mile from here. And that was old man Bowman's. When my grandfather homesteaded this ranch in 1886, this was the first building that he he built. This is where he lived. It's, it's a homestead shanty. Uh, it has a, the table that's inside there is the original table that, that he used in 1886. There was also a stove in there at that time and of course his bed. This one was up on 11th Street there on the Bill Will property and I bought that property from uh, uh, the real estate a lady lived up here along Jack Road, Margie Gaines, and she said, what are you going to do with that? And I said, well, we'll probably destroy it. Well, why don't you give it to the town council and we'll move it down there? And that's what they, they did. And the same over that old hotel. That was over here on um, Carly Tayton's property. I, I bought, bought that property from Carly Tayton and it had that old hotel on it. Margie wanted to move that over here. They was going to restore the thing, but you know, the studs are four feet apart in that thing. It didn't cost a fortune to restore that. I guess they haven't come up with that much money yet. It was uh, built, um, I understand, in 1885. You know, I, I didn't know anybody that lived in that except old Carly Tayton, who was a bachelor. And I used to go see him once in a while in there. That is the largest building that was built in Levenheim yeah, during the colony era. Um, it was built by one of the more wealthy colonists. His name was Herman Beck. Uh, he had a fairly large family. I think there was 10 in all. He intended to use that building as, as a hotel, and in fact had already named it the Germania Hotel. Uh, it was used for a short time as kind of like a boarding house. Uh, it did not represent what the colony homes looked like. Even though it was built by the colonists, it was not built by Herman Brack. The Olivenheim Eating Hall was something that the colonists, after they had been here 10 years, on their 10th anniversary, they decided to build something special. For, for their community. The uh, community got together and uh, they brought the lumber, which was brought out by a horse and wagon from, Inter from San Diego. And of course, the words weren't very good at that time. It, to go to San Diego was a two day trip. They brought the lumber out here and uh, they built this building. It uh, was uh, just a rectangular building uh, made of, of redwood. My granddad and my Uncle Herman, who John mentioned, hauled the lumber for that uh, haul out with a horse and wagon from the rail siding in Encinitas in 1895. So uh, my granddad helped build the thing. Early colonists had their, their meetings in there. Uh, they would, some of the older ones would go down there and, and drink beer and play cards you know, on, on the weekends, you know, Saturdays or Sundays. Before my time, actually, when, when uh, I would be in the 
body out in the car in the in front of the hall and my folks would be in here and we had a lot of we they drank a lot of beer at that time. During the World War II it was used very little. Uh, before that uh, there used to be dances here uh, maybe once a month and, and uh, the uh, the floor, I think that this is the third floor that was put in here. So you know they really stomped around on it. <laughs> they were very well attended because there was a lot of servicemen, marines, sailors, came out every every two weeks they had a dance. And the local band played. Uh, its brother was one of them to play, Herman Bielman, uh, Max Brink. Uh, Fred Harvey. In my time here, which started way back in the 30s, of course, the I was born in 17, and uh, by the mid-30s already, I uh, had these dances at least once a month, and uh, I never saw a bar set up in there, but the liquor was in the cars. One thing about this hall, I used to, uh, we always had horses uh, when I was growing up, and I, I used to take uh, groups on hay rides, especially church groups, and we, we had the bean boxes, and there'd be maybe 30, 40, 50 kids, I don't know how many, <clears throat> but we came over here to, to party in this hall. Well, that's before we had electricity. Um, we had a um, Coleman Menards that, uh, you know, used white gas. And one of these guys in the church was filling this lantern up at the uh, piano stool, and he spilled gasoline all over the place. He was just going to strike a match to light that lantern, and I caught him. That's how close it came to being burnt down. I don't like to see a lot of changes to the hall. I think there's some people that would like to see some changes there. To me, it's been that way for 110 years or so, and I, I just do not see it change a lot, you know, sidewalks and all this extra lighting and fences and all this kind of stuff. I think that'll leave it natural like it's been for all these years. It's, it's done good as far as I'm concerned. There wasn't really one, one single commodity that they, that they farmed here and sold. They made, their, they made their income from a large number of things. They farmed the fields and, and got, you know, oat hay and grain and barley. But all that was put back into the animals to, to feed the chickens and the, the cows and the horses. But there had to be an income, you know, with the chickens and then all the, they had 50 head of cattle here and the, the calves, they'd let them get 350, 400 pounds and then they would butcher them, take them to San Diego and sell them. But nowadays that wouldn't work that you can butcher here in the barn and take them to San Diego and sell them. That wouldn't work anymore, but it did in those days. Lima beans was our main crop, and our father was a very aggressive person. And those were raised without water. That was one thing about that lima bean. Um, you'd plant it, they would work the soil in the, in the winter time, and the, have a dry mulch on top of the ground, about an inch or two, and plant the beans with a bean planter. And they would plant them down in the moisture, and those beans would come up. And back in those days, we had fog. And you younger generations haven't seen any of that kind of fog for a long, long time. And you, you just had to almost get out and walk in front of the car because it was so foggy. Well, that's how the, the beans got irrigated. 
and they grew quite well here. Silas, Silas was pretty, he was a good carpenter, I was told. And, but he did farming. He also worked in the copper mines. The far end of Lone Jack, there used to be some copper mines. And, and, and he, he worked in the copper mines also. It's just a lot of, a lot of history and it's, uh, I mean, like in this barn, I can just look around and see things that, that my dad probably had and used his horse harnesses and stuff when he was a kid. You know, and they're just not, not any good for anything, but I just hate to, you know, just, just hate to part with them. Oh yeah, this, uh, this thing here, this, this corn planter, this, uh, I can remember this uh, belonged to my grandma, Grandma Cole, and uh, she used to have chickens. And from what I understand, she used to, to plant corn and uh, use the corn for the chickens. And it, it's kind of neat. You, you fill this full of corn and, and, you, and you just put it in, push it in the ground and open it up and it, it drops two or three seeds in the ground. So I've used it for all these years and years and it just uh, keeps it working. And uh, it's, uh, it's probably one of the oldest things probably around here. We had no electricity, no running water. My husband hauled every drop the water that we used in a, a big tank on top of a um, truck. And uh, so we were very careful with water. The kids, I put two at a time in the bathtub. So it saved water. We didn't waste a drop. We had a well, and I guess during the, during the winter months, there was, uh, there was water available. But during the summer months, uh, just about every Sunday morning, it was kind of a ritual my dad did. He would uh, put this big water tank on the truck, and there was a faucet up in uh, Rancho Santa Fe where we'd go up and, and get, uh, get a big tank of water. Sometimes you get two of them, then bring them up and dump them in the well, and then pump them up to our water tank. So uh, we had to be very careful with water. You know, we didn't have lawns. That's probably why my father never had a lawn that I can remember, because you know, he just never, never had the water for it. Yeah, existing business after he passed away, the tractors and, the, and everything were just kind of sitting here. And uh, my mom really didn't, you know, didn't have any, any use for them. So I uh, started out uh, a few advertisings around and uh, word of mouth. And now it's, uh, I have really lots of work in Disking. And uh, I still have his old truck that he, that he uh, called his tractor tractor on a 54 Chevy truck, and uh, there's several of his old tractors around that, that's still running. I've collected a, a few of them since then. Uh, most of the buildings that were, are on this ranch were built between 1886 and, and 1919, and this is probably one of the better remaining uh, examples of a homestead ranch in the North County of San Diego. Uh, this is a flail bin. Um, it's used for to thresh beans um, and other types of, of grain products. Uh, what you do is out in the in the field, you lit, for instance, uh, pinto beans. You would let them dry, and then uh, until you could finally get them in your hand and go like that and the, and the beans would, would break out of the pods. And when that happens, then you bring all your beans and you stack them in here with, with the straw and everything up to about this level here. And then you tamp it down with, with this tamping uh, club here. You tamp it down as tight as you can get it down, down in there. And then you take the flail and that's this instrument here. And it's, it's, it's on a pole, has a hinge up here, has a big, it's like a big board at the end. And you get that and you, and you hit the crop repeatedly with this flail and the impacting blows breaks the, breaks the pods and then the beans are able to filter out through the pods and down into the bottom of the, of the flail bin. It was a sickle bar mower that we were using, and uh, 
Richard, it had been tongued for horses, and Richard retongued it to use with the tractor, and we use it almost annually. Occasionally, we don't get enough rainfall, but most of the time, we get enough rainfall to be able to use it and cut the hay. And once the hay is dry, we will put it into shocks and then put it in the barn and feed it to the cow. The first water, I believe, came into the valley in 1961, and it, it was, it was badly needed, but that's what really changed uh, the character of Liebenhain. Uh, Liebenhain almost immediately began to transform from a, from a farming community to a residential area. Uh, our dad was the first president of the Liebenhain Water District, Water Board, and when they were organizing that, my dad, he knew everybody, and everybody knew him. And he went around and talked to each one of the voters. I believe there was 27 or 29 of them or something. But soon after 1961, you had a little bit of development start. Started actually quite slow through the 60s, uh, but in the 70s, you know, it began to speed up. And you tell, now when you drive through a leaving high, it's kind of hard to imagine that, that this was once farmland. This is the, the umpteenth Liebenheim beer and brat fest, and uh, we, because we are uh, of German heritage here in the Liebenheim Valley, we choose to celebrate it by having a spring beer and brat fest rather than the traditional October fest. And it's it's a, an opportunity for the neighbors to get together and to come together on a Sunday afternoon and uh, dance the polka and share the good bratwurst and the German pickles and the sauerkraut from Germany and the fresh potato salad. Uh, we have a lot of families as you can see and a lot of old timers and it's just really a great event that we enjoy putting on every year. People say, isn't this a nice place to live? A I say, yeah it is. But I do, I, do, I do say to them, you should have lived here 20, 30 years ago. You can look over here to the east, and in those rock hills, those, those um, lots probably sell for a million dollars a piece. But they're beautiful view lots. And they're hard to get to, they're hard to make. Uh, but, uh, it's just as the time went by that those lots were nothing back in the olden days when we were farming. Well, that land wasn't worth a dime. Mm -hmm. 